Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here in India. This is the first time for me, and I'm really enjoying it. During the next 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about extracorporeal blood purification techniques and more specifically on high flux therapies and atrops and surfaces. These are my conflicts of interest. And this is the city where I come from. I come from Lyon. This is the second city in France. And this is a city famous for the way of living. It's very cool to live there. I invite you all, if you come, just shoot me an email and I will welcome you. And you have mountains, you have the French Riviera, which is not too far, but above all, you have very good food and very good uh, bottles of wine. And uh, also, these two guys are quite famous because these two brothers are called the Lumiere brothers. They were living in Lyon and they invented the cinema. So the cinema was not invented in Hollywood in the United States, but was invented in Lyon uh, some time ago. So now let's talk about sepsis for uh, uh, a few minutes. So as it was said before, there is a new definition of sepsis was released uh, last year. And uh, you know now sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So I think this is extremely important because it brings immunology of, as part of the sepsis definition. So now if you want to do intensive care, what I tell to my fellows is that you need to study a lot immunology because immunology is now very present in the ICU. We need to know a lot about immunology. This is based on, uh, on data from, uh, a lot of data from Richard Hoskins from St. Louis in the United States. And he reported that when there is an infection, there is actually a double inflammatory response occurring together with a pro-inflammatory side and an anti-inflammatory side. And during the first days, the net balance is more on the pro-inflammatory side. And then after a few days here, you can see that the net balance is an anti-inflammatory side. And this immunosuppression state, immunoparalysis, is very deleterious for the patient because the patient at this stage cannot fight against secondary infections, cannot fight against nosocomial infections, viral reactivations such as CMV, HSV. And that's why a lot of patients die of sepsis at this time. When we receive a patient for septic shock in the ICU, the patient usually doesn't die here. When he dies, unfortunately, he dies later on after a few days, sometimes at seven days, 10 days, because of the secondary infections, because he cannot fight against this new infection. And this is due to the release of all these mediators, all these inflammatory mediators. So how to go back to immunomonostasis? You can do it in two ways, two ways of research. The first one is drugs. Uh, GMCSF, interferon gamma, IL-7 are at this time investigated, under investigation, but also extracorporeal blood purification techniques, you can see here, can bring you from the hyperimmune phase at the very beginning back to immunomostasis, and also at the immunoparalysis state, you can try some specific blood purification techniques to go back to uh, immunomostasis. So indeed, when you're an intensivist and you are in the ICU, you can initiate an extracorporeal technique for two reasons. The first one, of course, is renal support for acute kidney injury. That's as a standard. And then also for sepsis, you can decide to initiate a blood prediction therapy to modulate this inflammatory response. You know that 50% of acute kidney injuries are related to sepsis, so sometimes when you have sepsis-induced acute kidney injury, it could be beneficial, it could be interesting to get a therapy which does the two things at the same time, renal support and blood purification. So how to remove molecules from uh, the blood? You can do it, so you know this very well, by diffusion, by convection, and also by adsorption. What is adsorption? Adsorption is a mechanism by which the molecule, which could be a very large molecule, is going to be stuck on the sorbent thanks to three kinds of interactions, hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals forces, and ionic interactions. 
So do we know how all these blood purification techniques work, actually, in terms of pathophysiology? We don't know. We don't know how these techniques work. Should the target be the endotoxin, which is known to be the trigger of the inflammatory response? Should the cytokines, the inflammatory mediators after the endotoxins, should the cytokines be the trigger? This is a Claudio Ronco hypothesis, the peak concentration hypothesis. Or should we, ha should we expect uh, a direct, an indirect or indirect action on the leukocyte itself? Because we can also, now we have now new devices with whom the molecules can interact with the sorbent, the leukocyte can interact with the sorbent, leading to a modification of the leukocyte surface markers. And also now we have devices which are able to remove the leukocytes itself from the blood. Not only the endotoxin, not only the cytokines, but the leukocyte itself can be removed from the blood by adsorption. Should we remove activated leukocytes? So this is, this is the proof. You, can, you have here some electronic microscopy and immunofluorescence micro, uh, pictures showing that in some devices, this is uh, uh, the divinyl benzene beads from the cytosorb technology, you can see that some leukocytes, actually the neutrophils and the monocytes, not, not so much the lymphocytes, but the activated leukocytes can be absorbed on the beads and then removed from uh, the uh, blood circulation. So is it good to remove leukocytes from the blood when you have sepsis? Actually, I don't know at this time, but this is not so crazy because if you look at other diseases, other inflammatory diseases, like, such as ulcerative colitis, this is a treatment already proposed and which is done a, a lot, I think, in, in Japan. So now, let me show you the list of all the available extra blood purification techniques in 2017. So you have high volume hemofiltration, cascade hemofiltration, plasma exchanges, copolic plasma filtration adsorption, hemoperfusion, and the new membranes, high adsorptive hemofilters, and high cutoff membranes. So I'm not going to talk about all of them because I don't have enough time, and other speakers have, have already or will talk more specifically on s some of the techniques, but I'm going to mention uh, uh, some words about high volume hemofiltration. So high volume hemofiltration uh, was the, is the oldest technique, very promising in the 1990s in animal models and in the early, early years of 2000, uh, with a lot of interesting, promising data from observational studies. But the EVOIR study, which has been released uh, last year in 2016, which is a randomized control trial uh, a multi-center randomized control trial in Europe uh, randomizing high volume hemofiltration with 70 ml per kilo per hour of ultrafiltration versus uh, 35 ml per kilo per hour in patients with septic shock. And actually the primary outcome was 90 day survival and there was actually absolutely no difference. This study, I believe, killed this uh, technique uh, but not only because of the result, it's also because a lot of drawbacks are uh, 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 known to be observed with high volume hemofiltration, with the release of uh, um, the small molecules uh, in a, a very um, uh, high amount of uh, liquid. Uh, also the, the fact that it was said by, I think, Dr. Liu before, that your nurse is not going to be very happy if you run high volume hemofiltration in your unit and it's also very expensive. And also because of the release of all the other techniques, so I think this technique is not so much used anymore in, uh, at least in Europe and in the United States. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about this interesting technique called coupled plasma filtration adsorption. Uh, in this circuit, the blood goes first in a plasma filter here and then the plasma goes through this cartridge, from, uh, which is divinyl benzene styrenic resins. And then on this resin, the plasma, the cytokines are absorbed uh, very efficiently. So here you have the plasma cleaned from the cytokines. And then the plasma goes back to the circulation. And then in this part of the circuit, you can run 
uh, standard hemofiltration for uh, renal support, for example. So actually this is called a hybrid technique. Very interesting because you can do two things at the same time. You can do blood purification in the first part of the circuit and renal support in the second part of the circuit. So actually this is kind of interesting for sepsis induced acute kidney injury, I believe. So why is it interesting to run the plasma on the cartridge and not the blood, like for uh, other hemoperfusion uh, techniques. If you run the plasma on the cartridge, you don't have any clotting problems. So you can run the plasma very, in a very, with a very slow, in a very slow way, with a very low uh, plasma flow rate here. And if you decrease the plasma flow rate, then you increase the time of contact between the molecules and the sorbent. So you optimize your uh, adsorption when you uh, run the plasma on the cartridge. That's why I believe it, this is interesting. When you look at the literature in terms of data with coupled plasma filtration adsorption, there are about 20 to 30 articles. A meta-analysis was reported uh, last year, uh, in 2015, showing an interesting signal uh, in terms of uh, survival. And, but the most important study is the multicenter randomized controlled trial uh, called the COMPACT-1 study, uh, which was uh, published in 2014. In this study, the investigators compared standard treatment for septic shock versus standard treatment plus five days of CPFA. They wanted to recruit more than 300 patients in uh, 18 centers in Italy, but they stopped after 200 patients on the grounds of futility because there was absolutely no signal in terms of survival. It was exactly the same, so it was a, a negative study. However, they, the investigators ran a, a sub-analysis and they found that when the patients received a high dose of CPFA, then the survival was better. You have here the dose of CPFA and the, the, here this is the uh, mortality. So when the patient received a high dose of CPFA, then the mortality was decreased, and that was statistically significant. So based on this sub-analysis, they decided to start another compact study. This is called the Compact 2 study in Italy, uh, comparing high dose of CPFA versus standard treatment. So then we will ha have to wait for several years before getting uh, uh, the final answer for uh, CPFA. So let's talk a little bit of, about hemoperfusion, which is a very famous uh, technique in Japan. I think all septic shock patients in Japan uh, receive um, polymixin B hemoperfusion. This technique was not so famous in Europe and in the United States until the release of this publication uh, in JAMA from Claudio Rocco's group. Uh, this is a positive study uh, run in 10 Italian ICUs from 2004 to 2007 and they compared conventional treatment for septic shock versus conventional treatment plus two sessions of polymyxin B hemoperfusion. And that was, again, a positive study with a lot of improvement in terms of hemodynamics, in terms of respiratory parameters, and in terms of SOFA score. They even found a, 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 a statistically significant effect, positive effect, on uh, survival. The patients who received uh, polymyxin B hemoperfusion survived more uh, in that study. But it was still a controversial study because not so many patients, only 64 patients. And so we, we were waiting for the release of the two large multicenter randomized control trials with polymyxin B. The first one was released uh, last year. It's a, a, a study from Didier Parian in France. It's called the Abdomix study, looking at patients with septic shock due to peritonitis. And that study was very disappointing because it was totally negative. Even there was a trend of mort a higher mortality in the group with polymyxin B hemoperfusion. So very surprising uh, uh, results. And they were waiting for the Euphrates study. This is the American study, basically with the same kind of patients. And the, the paper has not been released yet, but it has been presented in several international meetings. So I can tell you that this is also a negative study. However, 
again in this study they looked at the sub subgroup analysis with a, a, a subgroup of patients and it, it, as you can see here in the patients with a, 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 a SOFA score of more than 9 and an endotoxin levels between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 they found a 10 percent decrease uh, in uh, the 28 day mortality so interestingly again in a subgroup of patients there was a positive effect so it's difficult to conclude uh, for polymyxin B hemoperfusion regarding hemoperfusion this not only polymyxin B hemoperfusion which targets again under toxin then you, you can also find in the industry this, the, the other devices the divinyl benzene uh, beads uh, proposed by uh, cytosorbs and this technology is able to non-selectively remove uh, uh, cytokines you see here TNF, IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-10 uh, uh, from the blood so this is uh, 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 also a, a new uh, technology proposed to remove cytokines uh, from the blood human studies are under uh, way right now with this uh, device uh, I'm going to say a few words about uh, Oxaris although it was already uh, mentioned so Oxaris targets the trigger of the inflammatory response the endotoxin it's an IN69 based membrane filter uh, based uh, of with polyacrylonitril and in which the company has added a positive charge at the surface of the membrane in order to remove negatively charged uh, molecules by adsorption uh, which are a heparin so it's a pre heparinized membrane but also other toxins so other toxins are removed at the surface uh, of the filter by uh, adsorption so not a lot of data uh, not a lot of human data with oxaris just animal data this is pigs with uh, in septic shock and uh, these pigs were they received a, um, a six hour hemofiltration session one group of pigs received oxaris filter and the other one received a, a standard membrane and uh, the, as you can see here this is the oxaris uh, data hemodynamics was improved uh, in the pigs with oxaris and interestingly the endotoxin levels were 10 times less important in uh, the pigs who received oxaris so the capacity of the membrane to adsorb under endotoxins were uh, demonstrated in this work high cut of membranes what, are, what, what is it so also the technological, technological improvement allows now the industry to propose uh, uh, membranes with uh, uh, an increase of the uh, diameter of the pores with the idea of with the goal of to remove uh, uh, a wider range of inflammatory mediators the main problem with these uh, membranes is that sometimes you can find in the literature some uh, clinical studies where uh, albumin was removed uh, uh, and sometimes in a very uh, high level 30 grams per four hours this is huge so these membranes are not used in daily clinical practice because of this so if you want to test or to try a high cut of membranes probably you need to use them in a diffusive mode like in continuous hemodynesis and not continuous hemofiltration because then you're going to limit the loss of albumin but also you need to use a membrane with a reasonable cutoff you can find in, in the literature and the in the markets some uh, membranes with a cutoff of 100 kilodalton 150 kilodalton of course this is way too much but if you use some high cutoff membranes with a cutoff of between 40 to 60 kilodalton this is called the super high flux membranes then maybe you are fine and we actually tested this this kind of membranes and we found that we don't lose a lot of albumin so maybe to use high cutoff membrane in a safe way would be to use them in a diffusive mode and with some membranes with a reasonable uh, cutoff so now when I am in, uh, uh, in uh, international meetings uh, sometimes I, I have a lot to face this question now quite a lot a lot of physicians they always tell me okay in the past there was a lot of data showing interesting uh, results uh, in observational studies in animals 
in preclinical works. But when we look at the randomized control trials, the large randomized control trial, these studies are negative. So some people, they say, okay, we should stop looking at these uh, extractable techniques because this is enough. So now, I will, this is very important because I believe they are totally wrong. This is, of course, no, for at least six reasons. First one is, this is wrong to say that all the results in humans are negative. This is positive study published in CCM 2013, John Kellum's group, meta-analysis looking at blood perfusion techniques, a lot of polymyxin B hemoperfusion uh, articles here, positive result. I, I've shown you this data from Claudio Rocco, published in JAMA 2009, positive study. In the compact one study, which is this is true negative. The sub-analysis was interestingly very positive when there was a high amount of CPFA done to the patient. This is positive data. This meta-analysis was also positive. And this sub-analysis with the polymyxin B hemoperfusion is also uh, positive. So all the, all the uh, people who tell you that all the data are negative are wrong. They are in, you look at the literature, you can find some positive studies. These three papers, the EVOR study, the abdomic study, and the compact one study, are the three negative large multicenter central mass control trials. But they are full of limits, full of limits. In two of them, they wanted to enroll, like for example, three or 400 patients. They enrolled 100 and 200. They did not reach the number of patients they wanted. So how can they conclude, and how can we all trust this data. And they are also full over the limits. I don't have time to uh, display. So be careful with these uh, three papers and maybe we should not draw uh, to uh, quick conclusions, I would say. Three, let's ask the experts from the surviving sepsis campaign. For the first time in history, there is a paragraph in the sepsis, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines about blood purification techniques and they don't know what to say. Our confidence in the evidence is so low in favor or against the blood perfusion techniques. So actually they cannot conclude. They are like us. When you look carefully at the literature, you have conflicting data. You cannot draw any conclusion, and this is what the expert of the surviving sepsis campaign uh, tells tell us. So I believe we should continue to do research. Four. So we've seen some large randomized controlled trials with high volume of filtration with CPFA, but did you see any large multicenter trial with cascade plasma changes? I mean large, several hundred patients. Hemoperfusion with cytosorbs, with auxiliaries, with high cut of membranes? I did not. I haven't, see, I haven't seen any large uh, multicenter randomized controlled trials. Why should we stop research in this field? I think this is very important and which might explain why you can find some negative studies. When you test a, a molecule, a drug, an intervention, anything, and if you take a too large population, then you can get three subgroup of patients. The first one, the intervention is deleterious. The second one, the intervention is neutral. And the last one, the intervention is positive. But the problem is when you look at all the patients together, then the positive effect can be hidden by the whole population. And that's why you can get some, uh, you get so many negative studies, I think, in medicine in general. And this is the future. The future is quite amazing to look at what the, the, the industry was proposing uh, 10 years ago and what the industry proposed now. This goes so fast. Look at this. This is completely crazy. This is from Harvard. Very serious guys, 10 million US dollars project. This is very complicated, I don't have time, 45 seconds left, so I will not go through details. But basically, this extracorporeal blood purification technique removes not cytokines, endotoxins, leukocytes. They remove this, they remove bacteria themselves. You can remove the bacteria with this device. 
other, on the other side of the United States, in San Diego University, this device is able to decrease the virus load. You can remove. So actually, what should we remove? Now we, can, we have technology to remove everything, endotoxin, cytokines, leukocytes, bacteria, viruses. So the industry is uh, um, now very powerful. And then I would like to conclude with this. So please, can, can I keep my conclusion? Thank you so much. That would be very nice of you. So sepsis is frequent, poor prognosis is, is very expensive. Very importantly, since to last year, now immunology is part of the sepsis definition. The patients who die of sepsis, they die of immunosuppression. All these extracorporeal blood fusion techniques, we should say that they are under investigation. The multicenter randomized control trial, they were negative, three of them, but were they all de well designed? I'm not so sure. What we should keep in mind is we have many unanswered questions. Which patients, which subgroup of patients, because I, I showed you that, you know, in some group of patients, you can find positive results. Which timing, which technique, what to remove? Cytokines, endotoxin, leukocytes, bacteria, viruses. So I, I hope I, I convinced you that research in this field should continue. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rimmel. Let's go over to the chairpersons for their quick comments for the next two and a half minutes. Over to you. Thank you. The only study, they have seen the mortality on 28 and 90 days, and they have used the plasma filtration of 200 ml per kg per day. What is the problem in the mortality, see the 28 and 90 days in compact one study, which was correct in your Rompa trial? Um, could you repeat which study? The compact one. Or compact one study, yeah. yes. So the compact one study was the, the negative study from, uh, with CPFA. The main problem with CPFA was the protocol breaches. A lot of patients, included in that study, did not reach the protocol. 50% of them because of clotting problems. So it was very difficult for the investigators to give a lot of CPFA, a significant dose of CPFA. And actually, only a few patients were given a high amount of CPFA. And very interestingly, this is, these are the patients who survived the best. That's why they start this compact two study with a high dose of CPFA versus standard treatment. And you know what? They are going to use citrate uh, in that uh, uh, study to avoid clotting problems and then to allow the patients to receive a high dose of CPFA. Okay. We're just time for one last comment if there's any from the chair. Anybody in the audience has a question rather than be asking? That was I'll ask. Anybody? I just have one question, practical. I mean, these are people are hemo these patients are hemodynamically unstable. So, how do they tolerate this procedure and the cost of it? With, with uh, the blood purification, immuno the adsorption, hemoperfusion. The cost of these techniques? Yeah, the cost, of course, is one issue. Most of them uh, are quite expensive. The high volume of filtration was quite expensive, as we said before. CPFA is uh, uh, quite expensive as well. Hemoperfusion, very expensive, several uh, thousand of euros uh, uh, the station. So you are right that it's difficult and that's why the uh, uh, international guidelines do not recommend to use all these techniques in daily clinical practice. This is because that would cost a lot of money and the effect in the literature is not demonstrated so far. So uh, I think when you use all these techniques, it should be, I think, an, uh, part of some studies, some clinical work in order to, to provide more data in the literature. Okay, I'm um, sorry for the interruption, Madam Chairman. That's all the time that we have for the discussion. Thank We'd you. like to thank the chairperson and the speakers and request them to please join us for the presentation ceremony.